So in a previous video, we talked about where this formula for a Taylor series expansion comes from. What we're going to try to discuss in this video is how to actually conduct a Taylor series expansion for a specified function at an indicated value of C. So what we have to do to make that happen is we have to find a bunch of derivatives of the function, right? This is the, the case derivative evaluated at C divided by K factorial times X minus C to the Kth power. When you're asked to actually carry out one of these expansions, the function is going to be specified. The C value is going to be, be specified. We just have to build the series and, and figure out what the rule for it is. And we'll try to do that for e to the x. So you'll notice that they specify e to the x as the function we want to do this expansion for. And we want to do this expansion at 0. So yes, this is a Taylor series expansion. But because it's based at 0, it's technically also a Maclaurin series expansion. A Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series that's based at 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start hammering away at derivatives of this. And this is actually a super easy expansion to do. Because when you just start taking first, second, third, fourth, fifth, five hundredth derivative of e to the x, it never changes, right? The, the, the first derivative is the same as the five millionth derivative. It's still going to be e to the x. So if we go back and look at that definition briefly, what we have to do with those derivatives is, is we have to evaluate them at c. This series is a Maclaurin series. It's supposed to be based at zero, right? C is supposed to be equal to zero. So if I put zero in place of these x's and, and find f of zero, f prime of zero, they all turn out to be the same, right? They all turn out to be e to the zero. So every single derivative, in addition to the function, evaluated at zero, which is where the series is based, is one. So if we look at the rest of this rule, what we have to do to, to build the series is we have to take all those values that we just determined, which were all ones. So the, the numerator of this fraction for every term that we write out is going to have to be one. We're going to have to divide those ones by k factorial. So whatever value of the index we're at within the series, we have to divide one by that value with a factorial applied to it. And then we have to do x minus where the series is based. And our series, again, was based at zero. So it's just going to be x minus 0 or plain old x raised to whatever the power is that's represented by the index. So here you see the, the ones, right? The terms that we were just producing in the previous two columns were all ones. Uh, I'm dividing those ones by the index value with a factorial applied to it, 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial. One thing that might throw you off a little bit here is, is the 0 factorial. 0 factorial is actually defined to be 1. So this is not a, a fraction here that's undefined. This is uh, 1 divided by 1 times x to the 0, which is also 1. This term here is, is 1 divided by 1 times x to the first. This term here, 1 divided by 2 factorial times x to the second. I could have produced the third term, the fourth term, the fifth term in a similar fashion. I think based on what we have here, we have enough information to figure out what the rule for this series is going to be. I'm starting with the index value of 0, I'm taking 1, I'm dividing by k factorial, no matter which value of the index I'm at, we see k factorial in every one of those denominators. What I have as the power on every one of those terms is just whatever the index is. So this would work for the 0th term, the 1st term, the 2nd term, the terms that you actually see on the screen, but it would work for the 500th term as well. So if we extended this out 500 places from where the series begins, we would see 1 over 500 factorial times x to the 500th as that term in the series. Next question. Okay, great. We've got this series representation for e to the x. Where does this representation hold? Is it a strong relationship? Is it a weak one? What's the interval of convergence? How many x values is this relationship good for? Well, using the ratio test is going to be what you're going to want to make sure you go with to make that judgment. So I've, I've got some other videos where I explain how to use the ratio test to check the interval and radius of convergence of a power series, which is essentially the step we're about to take with the series that we just produced. Uh, you can check out that other video. We'll just jump right into applying the ratio test to this particular series. So the ratio test says check the limit as you approach infinity of the next term, so the k plus first term. So from that rule from a few screens ago, I put k plus 1 in place of the k that was the exponent on the x. 
k plus 1 in place of the k that had the factorial applied to it within the denominator. And then I'm dividing by the kth term, right? So I multiplied by the reciprocal. You see the factorial move to the top, and then the, the x to the k term move to the denominator. When you use the ratio test with power series, and then also this particular power series involves a factorial, lots of cancellation happens. So I've got k plus 1 factors of x within this numerator. I've got k factors of x within this denominator. I've got one extra factor of x here than I have down here. So that's just going to leave me with an x in the numerator. No more x's in the denominator. This entire factorial is present within this factorial. There's one extra term present, one extra factor within this factorial that's not an element of this one, and that's the k plus 1 factor. So this entire factorial cancels with all but one of the pieces there. Within the series, within this limit, excuse me, uh, x is unaffected as k approaches infinity. So I have factored x out. I did have to keep it within the absolute values that the, the ratio test requires for us to use. Inside the limit, I'm just left with k plus 1 in the denominator. If I put infinity in place of that k, I get 1 divided by infinity. That's 0. The absolute value of x times 0 is less than 1 for every single value of x. So what we've just determined about the series representation for e to the x is that the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. Now, you would have to extend the series very, very far in order to get the relationship to, to be a good one uh, for, say, the x value of 500. But if you extended the series far enough, you'd eventually get there. Keep in mind, this is an infinite series that we just came up with back on the screen here. Right, so this process can be extended out infinitely. So the more terms we take, the closer the relationship is. And if we take enough terms, no matter what the value of x is, we're going to have a close correspondence between the function e to the x and the series representation that we've just produced for. One thing to keep in mind is we haven't necessarily proven that this series converges to e to the x. You'd have to use something called Taylor's theorem or Taylor's remainder in order to to prove that this series does converge to e to the x. Uh, what we're going to investigate in the next video is we're going to investigate what happens if we just take a handful of terms of the series. That's called a, a, taking a Taylor polynomial for a Taylor series. How close is the correspondence between, say, the first three, four, five, ten terms of the series and e to the x? But again, that proving that this series definitely converges to e to the x on the interval of convergence that we've just identified involves using something called Taylor's theorem or Taylor's remainder.